The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. Here now the word of the Lord as it comes to us from Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession, an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. This is the word of the Lord. As we continue in our series in the book of Hebrews, and what a wonderful series it has been to see the once for all sacrifice, particularly here in chapter 10, and then have that exhortation last week that began with the therefore. We have one more therefore this morning to endure by faith. Let's go to Lord and ask for his blessing on the preaching of his word and the hearing of it. Father in heaven, we thank you for your Lord's day and the word that is given to us this morning from Hebrews 10. Would you add your blessing by the spirit of grace to work this grace of endurance in us for your glory in Jesus name. Amen. William Wilberforce, a British member of parliament, is known for his advocating for the end of the slave trade in the mid to late uh, 1700s. He faced much opposition, much persecution for standing so firm in parliament, bringing him his motions forward and time after time getting spoken down and turned down and voted down. What was it about Wilberforce that caused him to endure those 20 years before 1807 and the end of the slave trade? What what made him endure is the question. Was it the cause for freedom? Was it the cause of caring for these slaves? Well, yes. But it was the way he was transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ that ultimately made him endure his whole life to see the end of slavery in Britain. In Hebrews, we have seen the theme of this once for all supreme uh, sacrifice of Christ. That Christ is supreme over all things, angels, Moses, the Levitical priesthood, the sacrifices. He 
is the once for all sacrifice. And last week we got to the therefore that said, okay, now how are we to then live? We're to draw near, we're to hold fast, and we're to stir up. That's the positive exhortation that the author of Hebrews gives. Now this week we see the negative exhortation to heed the warnings and his encouragement for endurance. His point is this, because of the better, all-sufficient sacrifice of Christ, then we, <clears throat> we can endure by faith in Him through sufferings all the way to the end. That's what the Hebrews were facing as they were struggling with temptations to go back to Judaism, to turn away from Christ. And so it is with us as we are called to endure to the end with Christ. So how are we to do this? How are we to endure the way that Hebrews is calling us through obstacles, through persecutions, through personal sufferings, all the way to the end? Two ways that the author of Hebrews gives us. In verses 26 to 31 we see the warning to endure under God's judgment. Secondly, from verses 32 to 39, we see the encouragement to endure by faith, by God's promise, by God's promise. We see the link in verse 25 from last week, as he calls us not ne to neglect to meet together, not to neglect the worship of the people of God, and to encourage one another daily, to encourage one another daily. Why? Well, the day is drawing near there at the end of verse 25, the day of the Lord, His coming judgment. But also we see in verse 26, for the, the purpose, if we go on sinning deliberately, and actually in the, in the original text, deliberately is at the front end of the sentence, making it the emphasis. If we keep on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Now, this is what commentators say is one of the most severe of the whole book of Hebrews, the most severe warnings. We've seen warnings in chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 6, and now again in chapter 10. We will see one more warning, but this is the most severe. Having once been enlightened, having received the knowledge of the truth, having been given the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and having our eyes enlightened to it, we deliberately go into sin. Now, we, this is, needs to be very clear what kind of sin we're talking about here. There is a danger here that comes with the responsibility of knowing the knowledge of the truth, having the knowledge of the truth of His once for all sacrifice. What kind of sin is this deliberate, willful sin? This is not just any type of sin. This is a defiance and a rejection of Christ and His work. It's echoing the Old Testament differential between the intentional sins and unintentional sins of the people of God in Numbers 15. This is the intentional sins that there is a resulting in death. It's the high-handed sin against God. The logic is clear from verse 26 into verse 27. If Christ's sufficient sacrifice has done away with the sacrificial system, there are no other sacrifices, and His is once and for all. If you reject His sacrifice, He says, there is no longer a sacrifice, a covering for your sins. In other words, there's no forgiveness of sins. This is a severe warning for these saints and for us. So what remains? Verse 27, a fearful or a terrifying expectation of judgment. That should shake us to our core. There is only a fury of fire 
that will consume the adversaries of God. If you turn away from Christ, the author of Hebrews is saying, and his sacrifice, there is no refuge for you against sin. And you are left under God's severe just judgment and you will be consumed. Verse 28 goes into a lesser to greater <coughs> argument between verse 28 and 29. And he says, if you are one that sets aside the, the law of Moses in the Old Testament, you die without mercy. He says, here's the earthly in, uh, punishment if you disregard or reject the law of Moses. Dying without mercy but even in the Old Testament, he says, in a lesser degree with earthly punishment, you have to have two or three witnesses to prove this offense. He's saying here, there is a warning for the people of God. Don't turn back away from Christ once and for all sacrifice. He says, instead, heed the warnings. The question for us is, are we paying attention to the warning that he has given? Because there is judgment from the living God if we don't. There is a greater responsibility, a greater accountability, he says here in verse 29. How much worse punishment? There's the key. He's, he's even reasoning with them. Do you think will be deserved by the one who has Number one, spurned the Son of God, has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and has outraged the Spirit of grace. Now let's look at those three things. He's saying this is the greater punishment, a greater punishment for those who have a knowledge of the truth in the New Testament times after the coming of Christ and who spurn the Son of God. Who, in other words, in some translations say, trampled foot on the Son of God. Now we know this title for the Son of God is showing forth who He is, His divinity. So it's a rejection of Jesus as the divine God-man who has come to save us. And then secondly, a profaning or treating as common or unclean his blood, his precious blood, the precious blood of the spotless Lamb of God that we see in Hebrews 9, 10, 14, and 20. This blood of the eternal covenant that was shed to cover our sins. If we reject the once and for all sacrifice, we are saying his blood is unclean and will not satisfy the wrath of God. Now, these are harsh things here given to us from the author of Hebrews. The spurning and the profaning of Christ and his sacrifice. I wonder if we take a look at this when we're tempted to sin. And the delicious appetite for sin would be quenched and, and, and done away with when we look at the way that we are trampling on his character and his sacrifice for us. If we go into that sin. But greater condemnation and judgment is heaped on us as we look at not just our response to Christ, but how it goes before the Spirit of God. Notice, it's not only against Christ, but it's outraging the Spirit of grace. Don't you love the, the title of the Holy Spirit there? The Spirit of grace, the grace of God given to us in Christ and applied by the Spirit. He is saying here, there is a greater sin of defying the gospel of Jesus Christ and blaspheming against the Spirit when we reject His sacrifice for us. He says there in verse 30, let me show you from the Old Testament again. Let me show you from Deuteronomy 32 and from the Psalms, Psalm 135, Psalm 50, that you are under the judgment 
of the living God if we continue deliberately in this sin of rejecting him. He says there, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Deuteronomy 32, 35. And then again, he says, the Lord will vindicate or judge his people. Psalm 135, Psalm 50. And we are falling in to the fearful expectation under the mighty hand of the living God, verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands the power and control of a sovereign living God. We've seen this theme of the living God in Hebrews 3.12 and Hebrews 9.14 and we'll see it again in Hebrews 12.22. This is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The question is, for these saints and for us, do we have a right fear of the Lord? Do we know His holiness, His otherness, His... His holy righteousness? Or do we come into His presence just any old way? Then we're missing the warnings here. We must pay and heed attention, pay attention to the warnings of judgment before the living God. This warning of this passage turns to the words of encouragement for God's people to endure. Look here at verses 32 to 39. After this severe warning, he gives encouragement from their former endurance. Notice there the conjunction, but. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened. After you were illumined by the Holy Spirit to understand the truth of the gospel you endured a hard struggle with suffering. Right off the bat, after being converted and enlightened in the truth of the gospel, they are confronted with sufferings. And what were those sufferings? Verse 33, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction. So they were publicly afflicted. And then sometimes being partners with those so treated. They cared for those in prison and they had compassion on them. Verse 34. And what happened? They were afflicted in very tangible ways. It says they joyfully accepted the plundering of their property. No one joyfully likes someone to take something that is theirs. We want to hold on to it. We spend thousands of dollars trying to protect what is ours. And he is saying, you joyfully let them plunder it. Why? How could they do that? He says, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. You had a better possession looking forward to the promise of God in the new heavens and the new earth that enabled you by faith to love those in their time of need and accept the plundering of your own property, accept the afflictions and hardships of persecution. Now, we don't know exactly when this persecution was, but many commentators believe it was during the reign of Claudius in AD 49. But what we see here is that they had walked by faith in endurance from the very beginning of their saving, uh, this, uh, the, the, the life of uh, these saints in salvation. They looked by faith to God's promise and believed it in the midst of their affliction. He's encouraging them, and they needed this encouragement, just like we do. You need encouragement this morning from the Word of God saying, the Lord knows what you're going through in, in your job, where you're standing for the truth of Jesus Christ and you're being set aside from that promotion or, or you're possibly even losing some of your salary because of it or you're being publicly uh, uh, afflicted by those who are opposing you for standing for the truth, whether it's at the grocery store or in the halls of Congress. We are facing as Christians persecution, whether it's the loss of reputation, whether it's the loss of 
of, of, of the ability to speak at times. He says, I want to encourage you to keep on going, to keep on believing the promise of God. Why? Well, he says there, in, he encourages us to endure by faith in this promise with a therefore in verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence. You see, these saints thought, well, maybe this, this affliction is so fierce and so much is coming at us that maybe we should go back to Judaism. And they feared walking it out with Christ on a moment-by-moment, -moment, day to day basis, and fear was creeping in as it does, and they were tempted to throw it all away. He says, don't throw away your confidence that he's talked about in Hebrews 3, 6 and 3, 14, that we are to hold fast to that confidence that we may endure because of the faithfulness of Jesus over his house. Hebrews 4, 16, we are to have confidence to draw near to the throne of grace because Jesus is our great high priest. We are to have confidence, Hebrews 10, 19, to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Our confidence is found in the character and work of Jesus himself. And when that is our confidence, there is a great reward. There is life eternal in Jesus Christ. He's saying, I want you to have a public boldness and assurance to stand firm in the midst of persecution. Therefore, he says in verse 36, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Do you need endurance today? This, this endurance, this word for endurance is a word that means patience or perseverance or long suffering. In our book we're using for Wednesday nights, The Character of Christ, Jonathan Landry Cruz says it this way, long suffering is the ability to endure hardships and trials, whether they be at the hands of sinners or not. Whether we're going through persecution or our own personal afflictions within our own lives, he says, the Lord is working in us this endurance by his grace, this patience, perseverance, this long suffering all the way to the end. And he weaves, look here at verses 37 uh, and 38. He weaves these Old Testament passages of Isaiah 26, 20, Haggai 2, 6, and Habakkuk 2, 3, and 4 to reinforce this. Isaiah 2, 26, 20 talks about the song of Judah and taking that phrase, for a little while, the coming one will come and will not delay. He's showing forth this coming judgment in the Old Testament against the wicked and against those who reject the Lord. In Habakkuk 2, 3, he shows as Habakkuk is crying out to the Lord in a vision that the Lord is going to raise up the Chaldeans to punish the wicked and his people are bound up in and under that judgment. And Habakkuk is, is taken back by that and saying, wow, what, wait, wait a second. I prayed that you would pour out your judgment on the wicked, but, but the righteous? How are we to live in that? And then in verse 4 of Habakkuk 2, he gives the response. The righteous shall live by faith. Here, the author of Hebrews changes it a bit and says, my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. He takes from the Greek uh, version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, and adds that my righteous one, my righteous one will endure by faith 
in Jesus all the way to the end. And then he says in verse 39, but we, he adds himself to this exhortation. We are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Dear ones, what's going to keep us from drifting away in this wicked and perverse generation? What's going to keep us from not drawing back or shrinking away, but standing firm through the midst of persecution and hardships? It's got to be more than a cause. It's got to be more than sheer willpower on our behalf. It will be by the transforming grace of God that empowers us day by day in the spirit of grace to bear the fruit of endurance, of patience, of perseverance, of long suffering. Just like Jesus, as we look to him who, who endured on our behalf, Hebrews 12, 3 says, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against sin so that you will not grow weary and faint-hearted. Look to Jesus who was despised and rejected and persecuted and believe the promise that those who endure to the end shall be saved. Mark 13, 13. Knowing all the while that we only endure by the grace of God preserving us. Hear what Peter says from 1 Peter 5, 10. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. What a hope. What a promise. We must trust in the God of all grace, who is also the God of all endurance, that we might persevere to the end. Amen. That was the key for Wilberforce, you see. It wasn't the cause for freedom or even the care for the slaves, although it was. It was the transforming grace of God that kept him year after year for those 46 years, even up until his death, to see the end of slavery in 1833. May we heed the warnings that call us to endurance through God's judgment. And may we be encouraged to endure by faith in God's promise all the way to the end. This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.